Okay, and welcome to a special topic video looking at quantitative easing, or QE for short. So QE has become an integral part of monetary policy in a number of countries over the last 10 years or so. Essentially, QE has been part of a strategy of cheap money brought in by central banks as a key policy response to the 2007-2008 global financial crisis. That crisis brought big fears of a return to depression and deflation of the type experienced in the 1930s. And economic historians will surely debate for many years the role of QE in staving off a depression and uh, perhaps the worst possible excesses of the financial crisis. Always remember when you get an exam question to make good use of the extracts. I've drawn together a short extract here from the ONS review of January 2018 and uh, points to the failure of the financial system and the fear that the interconnected nature of the global economy uh, was going to lead to uh, deflation and depression. Monetary authorities, in other words central banks, adopted highly expansionary policy to counter the negative effects on the global economy. In other words, monetary policy was, uh, the instrument of monetary policy was used to try to absorb the shock effect of the financial crisis. Policy interest rates were cut to their effective lower bound, that means zero. But, and this is a key thing, central banks and central bankers in many, many advanced countries, including the UK, the EU, the United States, judged that additional easing in monetary policy was needed to meet the objectives of policy, in particular to keep inflation close to target. And as a result, of course, we've had a period of very low interest rates and QE, which in the UK is now worth more than £400 billion. Pounds. So to put things into the big historical sweep, this chart from um, the Bank of England shows the policy base rate since 1700. Note the high and volatile interest rates of the 1970s and 1980s. Interest rates became more stable at around 5-6% in the early part of the last decade. But notice what's happened to interest rates since. In fact, if I just highlight on this chart the, the more recent period of the last 12 years or so, you can see the dramatic response that the central bank made to the financial crisis. Some deep cuts in interest rates from 5.5% in the late summer of 2008 to less than 1% by the early spring of 2009. They moved very quickly, perhaps learning the lessons from the 1930s depression. And since then, we've had a decade or more of very low interest rates. Interest rates actually fell to 0.25% in 2016 in the wake of the Brexit vote. They've nudged back up uh, to 0.5%, but, but keep things in mind. This has been a decade of very low nominal interest rates, unprecedented really in our recent history. So how does this uh, relate to quantitative easing? What is QE? Well, essentially QE is sometimes known as an unconventional, in other words, it's not usual, an unconventional form of monetary policy. Uh, essentially what it means is that the central bank is trying to bring some new money into the into the money supply. Uh, the central bank, in this case the Bank of England, creates new money electronically to buy financial assets, mainly so far government bonds. They buy them from institutions such as the insurance companies, the big pension funds and also the commercial banks. And in return, those institutions receive cash. So those institutions essentially are swapping illiquid debt, bonds, for liquid cash. As we stand, uh, £445 billion of assets have been bought by the Bank of England, the vast majority of which are government bonds. £10 million of commercial bonds has been bought as well. So how does QE work? Let's work through the basic mechanism uh, by which QE works in the UK. First of all, the central bank creates new money electronically. It doesn't print the notes and coins at a big printing press. It creates money electronically and uses that money electronically. In other words, it increases its own balance sheet and it uses the money it's created to buy assets from the private sector. Now, the key takeaway point here is that if, you're, if the central bank is buying government bonds, that increases the demand for bonds and therefore raises their price. The bond price goes up. And in doing so, because there's an inverse relationship between the bond price and the yield on a bond. Uh, bonds increasing price drives down the yield or the interest rate that the bond offers. 
So that leads to a fall in interest rates. Secondly, those who've sold their bonds, the pension funds, the commercial banks in particular, they may use the extra funds, the cash they get to buy assets with relatively high yields. So, for example, they might start to buy shares or to, or to buy high yield in corporate bonds or to put money into property or, or move money overseas, perhaps, uh, in search of high yields. And crucially, point five, uh, the replacing government bonds with cash in the economy increases li the liquidity of the banks. And the hope is, well, the hope has been, that with banks with more cash, uh, they're better funded to be able to lend them that money out to customers, business customers, households who need to need to take out a loan. And hopefully that will stimulate an increase in loan financed investment in the economy, which will have both demand and supply side effects. This is a useful uh, slide, I think, just to summarise the main channels through which QE operates. So I, I think there are essentially four channels to add to your revision notes. The first is the wealth effect. That if interest rates go down, the yield goes down, that leads to a, an increase in demand for higher yielding assets, such as shares, listed companies and bonds. So in theory, QE has increased, helped to increase the, foot, the value of the FTSE 100 index. And the rise in share prices for many people is a source of financial wealth. And that may be the case that will feed through to higher spending. The second effect is through the borrowing cost effect. Quantitative easing drives up the price of bonds. That drives down the yield on bonds. And the long-term yield on the government debt, for example, is oftentimes taken as the benchmark for mortgage interest rates. So mortgage rates are probably a little cheaper because of quantitative easing. Good news for potential home buyers in some sense. Third effect is the lending effect, that QE replaces bonds with cash for the banks. The banks therefore have more liquidity, and the hope is that banks will lend more out. There is a fourth effect, which is quite important, oftentimes missed out by students. If you have lower interest rates as a result of quantitative easing, that then can lead to an outflow of hot money, as some of that extra cash in the economy leaves the economy in search of high yielding investments. A fall in hot money, therefore other things being the same, may lead to a depreciation of the exchange rate. And a weaker exchange rate uh, is, a, is a boost to the price competitiveness of exporters and UK businesses that face import competition. So an improvement in net exports, X minus M, could increase aggregate demand. So there are a variety of channels, the so-called transmission mechanism, through which quantitative easing operates. This chart shows the interest rate on UK government bonds, 10-year debt that was debt issued in 2018 is repaid in 2028. Now, interest rates have been falling anyway. Uh, quantitative easing kicked in in early 2009. The central bank, Bank of England, has estimated that over the last 10 years or so, Quantitative easing has probably caused the yield on 10-year debt to fall by 1%. They have been falling anyway, of course, because we've had a period of very low inflation generally. There is a benefit, of course, if interest rates fall on bonds for the government, since a fall in bond yields makes financing a budget deficit less expensive. So another positive impact there. So, uh, in, in essence, what are the arguments for quantitative easing? What are the justifications for this strategy? I suppose the main argument I would put is that it's important for the central bank to have an additional policy instrument at their disposal. So they cut interest rates to near zero. But Keynesians would argue that there are problems with cutting interest rates to zero, particularly in a world where confidence is low and there's been a major shock, that a, a, a country and economy may suffer from a liquidity trap. In other words, people are not borrowing or spending more, even if interest rates are lower, because they just don't have the confidence. And the banking system may not be sufficiently resilient and, and uh, willing to lend out. So having quantitative easing as an additional uh, lever of policy, an additional club in the golf bag, can be seen as, as useful. And most economists would argue that QE has been a help in staving off the threat of of a significant deflation depression post-2008. You can make a case for saying that without QE, we suffered a 6% fall in output during the recession. That could have been significantly deeper, perhaps 10% or more. Unemployment rose to 8%, but might it have risen to 10 12% without QE. And of course, big falls in output, 
big rises in unemployment can have big longer term economic and social consequences. And the fact that we've had a decade or more of low long term interest rates may help uh, may have helped business confidence and uh, also given the commercial banking system some extra money to lend out. What has been the case is that QE has significantly increased the balance sheet of the Bank of England. This chart shows their total assets. And they're now at a, you know, this £400 billion pound plus asset purchase scheme. It means the Bank of England's balance sheet is, is bloated to the highest level it's probably ever been at, certainly since the bank was founded. So did QE help? Well, the Bank of England has been doing some work on quantitative easing. And uh, they argue, I suppose you'd expect them to, that uh, monetary easing, including both lower interest rates and QE, uh, led to lower unemployment, fewer people out of work, and higher wages than would otherwise have been the case. And they argue actually this has benefited younger people uh, because in the in the labour market, the demand for younger workers tends to be more pro-cyclical, it always goes with the cycle, than for older workers. They produced uh, two, two charts to support their argument. Uh, the first one shows real GDP and the, the actual data, what actually happened is in blue. Uh, policy loosening, by the way, is another term for an expansionary monetary policy. So cutting interest rates and expanding QE. And follow the purple line, they, this is the argument that said that the recession would have been deeper without policy loosening, without QE and cuts in interest rates. So we would have had a deeper recession according to their data. And they also applied the same macroeconomic logic to the labour market. Without QE, without cuts in interest rates, unemployment in the UK would have been significantly higher. Would probably still be around the 8, 9, 10% mark, as opposed to where it is now, which is close to, closer to 4% uh, than 8%. One of the other consequences for the economy of QE has been falling interest rates has acted as a stimulus to the housing market. This chart... Um, from the Bank of International Settlement shows what's happened to the real value of property prices in the UK adjusted for inflation. And you can see there was quite a significant fall in real property prices uh, 2008, 2009 as the recession kicked in, continuing to fall through to 2013. And since then, of course, the property market has recovered quite sharply in real terms, helped by QE, no doubt. So what are the counter arguments? What are the arguments for saying that QE has been problematic for the UK? It's important, of course, when you're preparing for exams to be able to evaluate arguments, the costs and benefits of a particular policy. Let me put five arguments your way and uh, see what you think about them. The first is that we've had a decade or more of very low, so-called ultra-low interest rates and uh, helped, of course, by QE. The Hayekian view, the Austrian school view, is that very low interest rates, whilst a natural response to the economic crisis, low interest rates over a significant period of time can distort the allocation of capital. So investment decisions which are given the go-ahead might not have been given the go-ahead at more normal rates of interest of, let's say, 5%. The marginal efficiency of capital might be, might be lower. And that's not necessarily good news for an economy in the long term. And there's also a view that low interest rates helped by QE have kept alive some zombie companies, companies of the living dead, who are basically able to roll over their loans and their financing on the back of cheap money. Had they disappeared, for example, the process of creative destruction, which you associate with the Austrian school, might have brought more new businesses into markets. The second point, I think, is quite significant, that QE has probably contributed to quite a significant increase in share prices and property values. Now, rising share prices, good news for the people with with money in the market. There's issues there to do with wealth and equality, I guess. Property values going up, good news if you, ha if you already have a property. Um, but this may have contributed to the worsening of housing affordability for many, many people, millions of people, particularly first-time buyers. The average age of first-time buyers has gone up to the mid-30s. Renting has become more and more expensive and you can make a case for saying that high house prices and rents have worsened, have impeded the geographical mobility of labour. Can you see the synoptic connections we're making here between QE and monetary policy and immobility of labour, which is essentially a micro-economic market failure? 
Third point is that QE hasn't done much to increase bank lending, actually. Uh, many banks are risk averse. They've been unwilling to lend out to businesses, particularly small businesses who need uh, some debt financing. A lot of the bank lending goes to the property sector. All that goes to mortgages rather than to the real economy, if you like. Real businesses wanting debt finance. Fourth point is that savers have suffered. So QE has helped keep this policy of cheap money. Long-term interest rates on savings have been in decline in real terms, oftentimes negative. And many millions of people rely on interest from their savings to fund uh, retirement, for example. And the other one is quite technical, but, but also I think important, that the pension funds have also been struggling. So the return on investments has come down. Um, pension funds, of course, rely on high-yielding investments to, to fund the pensions of, of the schemes they run. Therefore, as a result, the, the pension fund deficit is now estimated in the UK to be more than £300 billion, um, about 15% of GDP. And a lot of companies who run pension funds now have to pay more into their employee pension schemes for them to, to remain solvent, essentially, to remain solvent. And if you're paying more into your pension scheme as a business, you therefore have less money, perhaps, to spend on worker trading or to spend on capital investment. So you can make a case, a possible case for saying that QE might have harmed productivity growth in the UK over the long run. Some people argue, uh, like the former Treasury official Nick McPherson, that QE is like heroin. It's become We've become addicted as a country to, um, to cheap money. Uh, and that it's a case for the central bank to gradually reverse the policy of the last 10 years, particularly with unemployment at low levels and GDP returning to trend. QE is not meant to be a permanent policy. It was meant to be a essentially a temporary response to the financial crisis. So we have to wait and see what happens if the central bank in the UK does what the Fed is doing in the United States and gradually uh, unwinding QE, it's called tapering, and starting to put interest rates back up closer towards normal levels. Some other people argue that QE, okay, it's fine to f basically fund the banks with QE, but what about using QE for social purposes? So some economists and uh, commentators are now calling for what's called people's QE or QE2. Uh, this is now being muted. It's a form of QE where the central bank, for example, would fund bonds issued by governments which help to finance green infrastructure, renewable energy, uh, education, and also things like health or social care. So there's a lot of people saying, well, if the, if the Bank of England can, can use QE for 10 years to fund the financial system, why can't we use QE to fund essential public goods and merit good investments? A wider issue, though, a wider debate that might be worth thinking about. OK, so we've looked at some of the arguments for and against QE. We've looked at what QE is. It's uh, There's a... There's a a chance, I think, that QE could become almost like a permanent part of the monetary policy landscape. So we didn't even teach this 10 years ago, but now no student should go into the A-level exam without knowing what QE is and having some of the arguments for and against. Thank you very much for joining in this webinar. I uh, hope the revision is going well and uh, see you all soon.